everyone has a story. Stories have power. They help us understand each other. Roy, great to see you. Good to see you, Doug. Let's go chat. You bet. This Thank you. is Jessup's Journal. Roy, it's time to sign into Jessup's Journal. Hi, I'm Doug Jessup. Welcome to this episode of Jessup's Journal. With me today, Mr. Roy Banks. Roy, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Now, just so you know, it's this guy, this guy right here, that if it wasn't for him and what he did, you would not be paying for stuff on Amazon. <laughs> just just say. So we're going to get into that a little bit. But Roy, you know, number one, you know, I looked at your profile and there is so much stuff to talk about. I'm not even quite sure where to start. So let's kind of start from the beginning. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Amsterdam. Ah. In, yeah, in a little village called Zoost. Um, my father was in the Air Force, met my mother in Germany, was uh, reassigned to uh, Amsterdam. And uh, voila, that's where I was born. Okay, so yeah. then, you know, military guys, it's kind of hard to pin down, quote unquote, where you grew up, but was there a particular place you called home? Yeah, we, you know, we lived in a, in a number of countries, um, spent time in the Philippines as well, um, lived in a number of different states, you know, just as a, a typical military brat, you just kind of follow your father wherever he goes. Mm -hmm. Actually loved the, uh, the idea of being transferred every three to four years, got to know a lot of different people, cultures. But um, after my dad retired from the military, we, we moved to Great Falls, Montana, which is where one of the places my dad was stationed during his, uh, his time in the Air Force. And that's where I went to high school and ended up graduating from high school there. So I think Great Falls, Montana is kind of home and where I was kind of, you know, raised. A lot of the time when you get military families, you kind of follow in the footsteps. So uh, did you by chance join the Air Force? <laughs> no, I, it wasn't that I didn't try. I tried okay. to join the Air Force. Um, I actually served in the United States Navy. All yeah, right. well, I was, thank uh, you very much for your service. You're very welcome. So tell me about that story. How did yeah. you get into the Navy? Well, I was going to college at the time and I had recently gotten married, had a child. And you know what? I was working three jobs, going to school, not doing anything very well. Um, you know, trying to put food on the table and trying to turn um, in good grades in the classroom and trying to be a husband and a father just wasn't working. And so financially we were strapped. My, my, my son at the time, a young infant, went into the hospital. We racked up a lot of, oh yeah, he had a respiratory infection and racked up a lot of bills. And so I just felt like, you know what? I'm familiar with the service. So I went down to the recruiting station. I woke up one morning and I said, you know, I'm gonna join the service. Yeah, sure, yeah, for yeah. It. yeah. <laughs> didn't even tell my wife, by the way. Oh, yeah, oh, I just, oh, I, ended wow. up, I ended up just going down to the recruiting station and I, um, my first intent was to join the Air Force. So I went down to the, and it was a recruiting station that had, you know, Marine Corps, Army, Air Force, and the Navy and uh, went into the uh, Air Force recruiter and he told me I couldn't get in for nine months. And I was like destitute. I needed to get into the service. And so on my way out uh, from the Air Force recruiter's office, the Navy recruiter stops by and he had already known. He said, couldn't get in, hey, couldn't get in, huh? And I said, yeah. He says, I can get you into the uh, Navy in two months. And I said, sold. So anyway, um, I proceeded to join the Navy at that so point. So what did you do in the Navy? Um, I was a software engineer in the Navy. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, this would have been about what time frame? Yeah, so I joined the Navy in 1987. So it was a very new discipline within the Navy. In fact, the rating, which is what they called the job, didn't even really exist um, for very long before I had joined. But given the transition from, you know, uh, mainframe computing to microcomputing, they needed to have a uh, profession in the Navy that allowed for you know sailors to develop software for the use of uh, you know the Navy and the different operations within the Navy. So from 1987 um, to 1992, I served in the Navy as a software engineer. Wow. Okay. So how did that translate into civilian life? Yeah. So um, after I uh, when I decided to leave the Navy in 1992. Um, my wife's family, during the time I was in the Navy, had moved to Utah. My wife wanted to be close to her family, so we ended up coming here. And I always felt like I wanted to work at WordPerfect. You know, I was familiar with WordPerfect at the time, and um, I had learned that WordPerfect was based out of Orem, Utah at the time. 
And uh, I said, you know what, Christy? That's my wife's name. We ended up, when we moved to Utah, I'm going to get a job at WordPerfect. And within literally six to eight weeks of moving here, um, I became a, a WordPerfect employee, started in the international division, started, you know, helping develop software. Did you use the GI Bill? I did. Yeah, I did. Let me tell you, you know, one of the things, I'm a big fan of the armed services. And, you know, because what it did for me was it gave me a vocation, gave me a profession, gave me um, experience at a very young age. Um, gave me an opportunity to serve my country, you know, and you know, I'm, I'm part of the less than 1% of people that have served and had the honor of serving in, in, our, in our nation's uniforms to protect our, our seas and our borders. And uh, so just a great privilege for me, but it also gave me an opportunity to earn the GI Bill. And, uh, you know, I ended up going to college after I left the service, I was working full time. I went to Utah Valley um, University, which, which is where I went to school while I was working, and I used the GI Bill to pay for my education. So it worked out perfectly. I graduated with a bachelor's degree in business management and um, came out of school debt-free because I was able to Whoa. pay for college using the GI Bill. That's something it'd be hard to say nowadays. There was something that a little birdie told me that was kind of special about you and that bachelor degree. Yeah, well, first of all, when I went to UVU, it was Utah Valley State College, and I yeah. actually graduated with a bachelor's degree um, from Utah Valley State College. I haven't had, uh, I haven't changed the name of the, the name of the university on my diploma yet, but <laughs> I'm actually kind of proud of UVSC. Uh -huh. But um, I started there when um, the baccalaureate program was in its infancy, and I believe I'm one of the first African Americans to graduate from UVSC with a bachelor's degree. So I'm very proud of that. Very cool. And also, I'm the first college graduate in my family. Ah. Yeah. So um, and and you know, I've had and <laughs> I've had. Four of my children go to UVU today. Ah, there you yeah. go. So okay. we're, we, we bleed uh, Wolverine green in the <laughs> Banks family. There you go. Yeah. Well, the other thing that, that you brought up is the first, okay? So you were one of the first African-American uh, graduates from there. But a lot of what I've also looked at is you've been a first as a uh, African-American CEO at a variety of companies. Yeah, I have. There's one that I want to talk about. Okay, I know that you're the CEO of Weave right now, which is pretty cool, we did a story on that. But there's this one company that I went, going, oh dang, I got to talk to this guy. Okay, so Authorize.net. Now for the people out there that don't know, Authorize.net is the guys that basically came up with e-commerce. How in the world was that like? Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not the founder of Authorize.net, but I was, part of the early management team of that company. Um, a gentleman by the name of Jeff Knowles was responsible for uh, uh, starting the business and had the vision for making it possible, listen to this, making it possible to accept a credit card payment on a website. That's something that we take for granted today, right? You know, exactly. it's like, you, you think that, you know, it's ubiquitous, it's expected. But in the mid to late 90s, that was not something that a lot of us were familiar with. In fact, when I first was recruited to join this young, young, young startup, I thought it was ridiculous. I'm thinking, wow, why would anybody want to do that? Because at that point in time, the internet was really just kind of like a brochure site. It was like where people went to learn and obtain information. And um, in fact, I rebuffed them the first time they came at me. That shows <laughs> wow. you how, uh, how things have changed for me because uh -huh. You know, I, I, was, I, went, I don't know that I was fearful of technology, but I couldn't, I didn't appreciate it for what it could do. And um, so after my first refusal, they came back at me, a good friend of mine named John Bodine um, really worked hard to like uh, have me come on board and I saw the vision and I said, oh my goodness, this is gonna be revolutionary. We are actually going to create a new medium in which people can conduct business. And we're gonna make, we're gonna make things that are accessible, that were once accessible to people just in a small local community available to the world. And um, so the technology was basically um, to make it possible to enter a credit card number into a web form, take that information and process it the same way that a retail point of sale machine processes at a retail store and authorizes a transaction. And uh, that company we watched, you know, we, we went from hundreds of customers to thousands of customers to 10,000s of customers, from hundreds of transactions to thousands of transactions to millions of transactions and billions of dollars that we processed. 
and uh, we we would like to think that authorized net was we put the E in e-commerce. We oh, yeah. were part of the, the, there were other companies doing it, but we literally became one of the more successful early pioneers that helped really transcend into this new digital economy where um, you could buy things online. Now you look at it, um, we have, I have children that couldn't imagine a world without buying something online, yeah. you yeah. know? Speaking of credit cards, I understand you guys actually got bought, or I should say authorized.net, got bought by Visa of all yeah. things. It's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Did you guys realize how big of a deal it was, you think, when you were really, when you were just there, did you realize the impact you were gonna have on the world? You know, I've been in technology for what, close to 30 years now. And um, I've seen it from, you know, being a senior leader in a company, um, being on the buy side and the sell side of selling companies. And as you meet, you know, all of these fascinating, you know, entrepreneurs and these tech startups, um, I think we all always have the same ambition. We want to change the world. We want to we want to do something grand. And I think that you have to have that type of ambition. But you're so focused on doing the necessary things that require day to day work and effort. And um, so I think that while you have that ambition, boy, you always got your head down just doing the work mm -hmm. and it's wonderful when it pays off. And um, so I think when we first started, um, and especially for the earlier people that were there before me, it was a grind. I mean, oh, yeah. just a grind. And um, you, you have some setbacks, you have some challenges, um, but then you get to an inflection point where you start to see, hey, this is really starting to happen. And, um, and so eventually you, you, we all work for that moment and that, that, that opportunity. And um, yeah, we ended up uh, selling the company a couple of times, and you know, Visa and uh, eventually ended up buying Authorized Net, um, and that's why Visa is located here in Silicon Slopes. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, that's why ah, they're here. Very cool. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you to put out that crystal ball. Okay? Yeah. Okay. And I realize this is kind of putting you on the spot, but there's all kinds of different technology and things like that. Uh, I mean, when I was a kid, I remember investing in this company, that. Um, made this machine that made an awful racket. We weren't allowed to get very close to it, but you could put a hot dog in this thing, push a button and go, <laughs> you know, and it was a microwave oven. Yeah. Changed the world. Yeah. What do you see? Is there any kind of industry or any kind of product or service out there that you think that five, 10 years from now, we're going to go, oh yeah, we were, I remember that. That was, it was no big deal then, but we can't even think about not having it now. Yeah, I just with the velocity of technology and the rate that that things are being innovated and, and happening. If you look at AI, artificial intelligence and predictive analysis, we are you're already seeing it like, you know, with the idea that autonomous driving. Who I, I'm kind of an old combustible engine guy, right? You know, I love the sound of a nice, you know, throaty V8 motor. You know, you get inside of a Tesla, you can't even hear it, right? You can hear, you know, this, this, this symphony of classical music that you're playing, right? But your car <laughs> is creepingly, you know, quiet. Um, I think what's gonna end up happening, and it's very, very clear is that, um, I think artificial intelligence and predictive analysis are really gonna define the new um, era of technology. It's gonna be this idea that things are gonna happen around us by just virtue of us being in an environment. We're, it's like this idea that we're gonna be acted upon just because we're there. Um, I think, you know, autonomous driving, I think it's, it's not a matter of if, it's when. I think it's, I think it's gonna happen. Um, you know, I, I also believe that we live in a very connected world. Think about it, it's about, you know, the internet of things. We're all connecting to each other, you know? We connect through handshakes, but guess what? The handshake is going to be replaced because as soon as I walk into your vicinity, my phone is going to start talking to your phone. Or whether it's not our phones, maybe it's something that's embedded inside of us. But we're going to have this, this informal digital exchange. And it's just going to be passive technology exchange that's going to add and create opportunity that we don't even know. I can, like Amazon Go, you can go into an, Am the Amazon's piloting a store where you literally walk into the store you pull the things off the shelf that you want to collect and buy, and then you walk out. Because the moment that you walked into the store, they've authenticated and registered you. And they've tied to some payment capability within your financial resources. And so they're going to completely you know, get rid of the whole checkout process. Yeah. So it's this idea that 
that you know, through artificial intelligence and through this passive connectedness, we're going to do things that, uh, and we're going to ex- we're going to have these experiences that are just so technology driven, based on our location, our proximity to things, and the things that we we have on us. And so that's what I think is going to happen. And I think you're going to see a lot of that manifest, not just in um, uh, uh, the automobile industry, but I think you're also going to see and experience that in retail yeah. and, and, and things like that. Well, now talking about retail, I mean, you've got brick and mortar. Is brick and mortar dead? Um, no, not at all. Not at all. I think the, the, the thing, that, and, and you know, I'm, I, I'm the CEO of Weave, and I can tell you that, you know, our our whole business is servicing brick and mortar and you know our business is growing and we see certain verticals thriving and the reason for that is because they adapt they leverage technology to serve and meet the communication and engagement and experience needs of customers and so the brick and mortar companies that don't survive are the ones that fail to adapt to technology Good point well you know that's going to be interesting is you know a couple of years from now, you and I are going to go have lunch somewhere, and uh, you know they'll take our order because we walked in and we thought about you know what kind of sushi we want or something. Right. You know, and we're going to look at some kind of device, and we're going to watch this interview and go, hey, he was right, there it is. Or, or they're <laughs> going to know who you were before you, as soon as you walked in, and they're going to say, you know what, Doug likes to eat clam chowder every Tuesday. And they're just going to order for you because you know what? They know what your habits there are. There you go. Okay, right. so apparently we're meeting at Market Street. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite restaurants, oh, yeah, by the way. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. So you said you were the first uh, African American bachelor degree person at UVU. The thing I'm trying to figure out is you're also, I could be wrong, but you know, you, this is Utah. And I got to think that you are one of a very few black CEOs. How does that play? Because the thing I'm trying to figure out is I've interviewed a number of people and um, for example, I just interviewed a woman that she is the CEO of a accounting firm. Well, number one, there's not a lot of women accountants, but there's definitely not a lot of women CEOs. And she said a lot of it is because there weren't people that looked like her. Were there very many people that looked like you to motivate you? No. I've been the only one in the room for most of my career. And it's not just because um, of my industry, um, but it's also because of where I've lived. I mean, Utah just doesn't have a lot of diversity. Is it improving? Is it, is it becoming more diverse? Absolutely. I think Utah is finally gaining the reputation of being a place where People of, of, of different, you know, uh, min- uh, uh, races, ethnicities, nationalities, gender profile, they can finally come here and really, um, and find ways to really excel. But for me, I've always been the only one in the room. I've never met another tech CEO in Utah that happens to be African American or black. Haven't seen it. And so for me, I wanted to, I aspired to that because I wanted to fulfill the potential and opportunity that I felt I could earn um, based on my, my hard work and effort and the way that I prepared myself for that opportunity. You know, it's funny, I'm a CEO who happens to be black. That's the way I look at it. Mm-hmm. I'm not the CEO of Weave because I'm black. I just happen to be a black CEO. But I understand the profound responsibility that comes with it. I don't get the same number of chances to fail. I have to be twice as better of my, as my contemporaries. Remember when I was in the Navy, mm-hmm. uh, there was a female officer, I was enlisted, and I remember talking to her, just got to know her over time, and I just asked her, I said, what's the toughest thing about being in the Navy? She goes, I have to be twice as better than my male counterparts. And I remember hearing that, and I'm thinking, really? She goes, I have to know my job better, I have to sh- my shoes have to be shinier, my, my, my uniform has to be crisp, and she goes, because you know what? I don't get the same number of chances. And I, and I don't think I understood the profound nature of what she was saying until, you know, I, I, I've seen, I, I, was, I became a, an, ex, uh, an executive leader in, in companies. So it's, it's um, but we do, we need, we need more mentors. We need more icons out there um, and that, that, so, that, so that others can see that it's possible. 
Because I didn't have, I, I don't remember even as a child seeing or hearing about a black CEO. The most successful black person I ever saw when I was a child was an athlete or, and I even hate to mention this given what's happened recently, but was, uh, you know, Bill Cosby in, on the Cosby Show being a successful doctor. But that was it. We didn't really have those kind of mentors. And so, um, but it's been, it's been, and I, and I'm in the finance, I've been in the financial technology industry for most of my uh, career as well. I go to trade shows. I've sat on a uh, public, uh, on a, um, our trade association board of directors, the only African American for 10 years. Really? In that board, that, that trade association board. I go to trade shows where you'd have thousands and thousands of people and there'd be a handful of, of, of blacks. So. It's been it's been um, it's been a little bit of bit, bit of a challenge being the only bl one in the room sometimes. So most of the time. So if there's a kid watching this right now, kid of color, okay. What kind of of advice would you give them? First of all, I'm going to tell you that you don't have to be a rap star or an athlete to excel in this world. You don't you can obtain education, you can find ways to pay for education, you can, um, you can be anything you put your mind to. I have a mantra, it's volunteer for the impossible. I'd like to do hard things. I always tell people the time to volunteer to do something is when no one else does, right? So if, you, if someone says, hey, who wants to go dig that hole eight feet deep? And when no hand goes up, Yours better go up. Do hard things, but don't accept what the media, what society is going to tell you are your limits. Because there, I, I came from very humble circumstances. Um, you know, my parents didn't pay for my college. In fact, my mother said, hey, look, the best thing you can do is study the dictionary and learn how to talk. Because get a large diction and vocabulary. Sound smart, because mm -hmm. I can't put you through school and um, some of the best advice I've ever had. But my dad taught me a work ethic, work hard. But yeah, young people need to um, um, re, uh, you know, uh, g grasp beyond their reach and, and don't settle for the limitations that um, society puts on you. But um, hard work, education, all day long will, we'll, we'll, and you know what? I would tell people, um, join the service. I mean, I'm not, I'm, not get, I'm not getting paid by the Navy to be a recruiter, but I'll tell you, join the military. It's a great way to um, not only to honor your, your, your duty as a citizen, but it's a great way to, um, to, to earn the, the, the means to, to get, a, to get the, uh, the financial support to earn a degree. Especially if you can earn a degree debt-free, like yeah, you did. that's right. Ooh, wow. From what I understand, you're not the only Roy in your family, <laughs> and it wasn't your dad. So you want to share a little bit there? Or I'm not sure I can go there. Tell me about your family. So, um, well, Gia, you know, I have the family I grew up in, which is uh, I have a mother and a father. My, my dad is from Texas. He's from Texarkana, right there on the Ar Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas border. Um, he's African-American. Um, and then my mother's German. So uh, he met my mom in Germany. So uh, I always like to kid and I refer to myself as German chocolate. So people get a kick out of that. Um, I have a brother who's a year and one day older than me. And then I've ha I have a sister. My mother is actually married before she married my father. But um, interestingly enough, about, I don't know, call it 11 or 12 years ago, my mother called me and says, hey, Roy, I have some news for you. She said, uh, I need to tell you something that's very hard and difficult, but you're going to learn it one way or the other, so I might as well tell you. She said, um, you have another brother that we've never told you about. And I'm like, what? You know, that's, I felt like for the moment I was like in, you know, having a, 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 a I was like on a lifetime television series moment. And she said, yeah, you have a brother that um, your dad had an affair, nothing to be proud of. Um, and uh, you have a brother who is, uh, literally the same age as you. He's about two months younger than me. And, um, and, I, and you know, the next question I asked is, well, tell me about him. Well, she said, his name's Roy. And I'm like, are you kidding me? He has the same name as me? Did they, did they, did they, did this, was this intentional? And uh, anyway, so yeah, I have a, I learned that I have a, a brother from another mother. And, uh, <laughs> oh wow. And, uh, and a very wonderful, wonderful man. Mm -hmm. Wonderful man. He um, actually lives in Tel Aviv. 
And, wow. um, and you know, not that it matters, but he, he, it, 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 he's really introduced and he's really blessed our lives because come to find out he's, he's, he's gay. Um, and, you know, he's, uh, he came to the States. I arranged for him and my father to get together. He came with his, uh, his, uh, his significant other. And this was back when Utah was, it, we were kind of facing Prop 8 and um, came to the United States and then ended up going to New York and they got married. So they're happily married. They adopted, they've adopted two kids. He's the first, keep in mind, another Roy with first, mm -hmm. the first uh, gay couple to adopt a child in, in Israel, in, in Tel Aviv. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, um, so there's that. And then um, I also have um, now my own family, you know, as, a, as an adult, my, um, I have six kids. I have uh, um, two grandchildren. And I have five boys and a girl. Our girls are caboose, and she just recently uh, graduated from high school. So we're officially out of the high school years and, and uh, in the college and grandparent years. So it's been wonderful, been wonderful. And I have a beautiful wife. She's uh, Yes, not forget. Yeah, okay. yeah, I have a beautiful wife. Uh, her name's Christy, and just uh, amazing. We've been married almost 35 years. So we've been married a long time, and we've found out the secret to marriage is, uh, you know, um, Give and take, right? Give and take. And uh, couldn't have asked for a better companion and a better mother for my children. You know, this is my journal. The series is called Jessup's Journal. And my journal has got all these scars and brands and things like that because I got to make this personally. And uh, they actually made one for you that's nice and smooth. Okay. So, oh my goodness. So here you go. You've got a, a new journal from the folks at Rustico. This is beautiful. Look at that. So they have you got my name on it. Oh, yeah. Did we spell it right? Yeah, you did. Right, there you go. Yeah, you did. Thank you very much. So the thing I'm looking at is that they have a hashtag. It says, leave your mark. So Roy Banks, how do you want to leave your mark? I want people to remember me and to know that the work that I've done um, came because I'm not perfect, but I strive for perfection. I... Uh, I, I tell people, I make a lot of mistakes. I do, I make a lot of mistakes. Um, I'm about personal refinement, trying to improve every day. Um, just to get personal just for a moment, Doug, I, have a, I used to have an anger problem. I had to go to therapy. That's, you know, to, to, to submit yourself to, to, uh, to mental health guidance and support is uh, that's a tough thing for a lot of people because you know you don't want people to think negatively of you but I'm proud of the the therapy that I've received and the outcome of that do I still get mad and angry yeah but I'm I'm better for it but um, I'm trying to be better every day and I just want people to know that um, I believe that when you think of me it's not my success it's not the financial rewards that I've had it's the way that I've been able to help others fulfill and live up to their potential. Because that's, that's what I believe we're all here for, is to uplift others. And it sounds very trite, it sounds very parochial, but at the end of the day, um, if I can just lift one person up and make them better and help them, whether it's personally or professionally, boy, I, if, I can, if, if that's what I am, if that's the sum of everything that I've ever done, I will have been the most richest man ever because, man, there's nothing better than to leave an indelible mark on an individual and lifting someone else up that didn't believe in themselves but saw in you what they could become. What a beautiful way to really pay it forward and to pay it back. So that's how I leave my mark. Well, Roy, thanks for coming on Jessup's Journal today. A couple other people I want to thank. Of course, we've got the folks at Five Wise. Uh, they make the hand sanitizer and, yeah, adult beverages. Rustico, of course, makes my journals. Clear, you know, you, you think about washing your hands, but have you thought about washing your nose? <laughs> Serious, clear nasal Makes spray. sense. Good stuff. Of course, you also have Taylor Cooperative, and let's not forget my favorites, JW Custom Hats. Here's the thing I want people to remember. Everyone has a story. Stories have power. They help us understand each other with another entry into Jessup's journal and Roy Banks, the, the original Roy Banks. <laughs> I'm Doug Jessup, ABC4 News.